It is 1626. Along the rocky New England coast, there are several new settlements. It's a small community, numbering scarcely more than 30 people. Robert Trent here is a fisherman. He built this bark wigwam with Albert Sims and Jason Conway. As yet, there are few women in Nomkeg. The beds are hung up like this every morning. But the fires dying out is a rare occurrence. Over at the Fox dugout nearby, morning tasks are likewise underway. Mr. Fox is hewing newly felled fur. That's something that has to be done in carving a home out of a wilderness. Lucinda Fox is grinding Indian corn, a food important to all the settlers, while Brother Oliver milks the family goat, a highly prized possession brought from England. And now, Jason has laid the new fire and must borrow a live ember to light it. Here he is at the Fox place. Would there be an ember in your fire for some careless bachelors, John? That there would, Jason, and you'll be welcome. Do but speak of it to Susan. The Nomkeg settlers share dangers together, and they gladly share comforts, too. How seems Master Robert today, Mistress Fox? I fear me there is little change. The fever has not left him these many days. One day, when you're well again, laddie, you can hunt deer with Jason. The fireplace doesn't always give adequate heat, especially when there is sickness in the house, sickness that may be very serious. Today, as always, there's a full schedule of work ahead for the bachelors and the entire community. It's time for Mr. Fox and Oliver to set out for the fields. Their clearing is just over beyond this ridge of rocks. There is a good view of the ocean from the ridge and Mr. Fox and Oliver are glad to see their neighbors hauling in a plentiful catch of fish. Food from the sea, food from the land. The settlement will need both when winter comes. The first corn crop is coming along well, thanks partly to the Indians who abandoned some cleared land in these parts even before the settlers came. The sight of ripening corn makes John Fox feel confident it makes him eager to clear the ground for larger plantings. It isn't easy, this clearing of a wilderness. It isn't easy removing the stones from the rocky New England soil. But it makes a difference when you're building something new. Jason here, repairing the roof of the bark wigwam, had a far more comfortable house in Dorchester, England. But this is a new home in a new land. It makes a difference. Albert Sims, who grows and harvests his own tobacco, takes as much satisfaction in his small crop as do the big plantation owners of Virginia far down the coast to the south. Thus, in the field and in the home, the Nomkeg settlers carry on day in and day out. The scant food supply must be carefully doled out and with tallow scarce, pitch pine splints are fashioned by hand for candles. Even when the long day's work is done, there may be heavy burdens to bear, but there is faith and gratitude. Our Father, it hath pleased thee to set us upon this alien shore, where thy bountiful providence hath granted us shelter and our daily bread. For all thy many blessings, our hearts are humbly grateful. We beseech thee, if it be thy will, that in thy great mercy thou wilt spare this, our little son. This is the Nomkeg of 1626, close by the New England coast where the waves surge against the shore. Three years pass. It is 1629. Nomkeg is now called Salem. A number of craftsmen from England have joined the growing settlement. These sawyers are cutting the timber of the New England forests into strong, straight boards for houses. Others are making shingles for some of the better homes. Shingles split from logs by hand 
and shaped by skillful artisans. And here at the newly built brickworks, clay dug from the earth nearby is ground and mixed and moistened and then placed into molds. Sized and shaped by the wooden forms, the blocks of clay will be dried in the sun and later hardened in kills. Bricks for chimney and hearth and fireplace. Nearby, the newly arrived blacksmith beats out nails for the ever more numerous houses. The iron for the nails and the coal for the forge have to be brought from England. But the actual manufacture can now be accomplished here. Even so, to the local supply, must be added nails of English make. Yes, building is going forward here in the expanding settlement. Blending practices old and new, men mold materials domestic and foreign to the purposes of a growing community. It is no longer merely a few dugouts and bark wigwams. Dwellings have improved. What was an outpost of settlers has become an established village. New buildings, new people, new and increased activity. Many are the changes growth has brought. It has brought a code of established law. It has brought the stocks and pillory for those who would break the law. As newcomers have established themselves in the village, the older settlers have joined with them in many community tasks. Here, Susan Fox, whose little boy was so ill, is helping some recent arrivals to prepare a kettle of soap. The ingredients she uses are animal fat and lye prepared from wood ashes. Out in one of the new clearings near the settlement, John Fox is giving another newcomer a lesson corn planting. Following the Indian method, he uses fish for fertilizer. Now he takes the carefully saved seed corn to place on top of the soil covering the fish. Then a little more soil is added. It is a manner of planting the savages have taught us, and a good one. Never did I see such planting in England. There be many new ways to be learned. Many. Yes, there are new ways to be learned in this new land. The changes in the community, however, have made but little difference to Robert Trent. Although many of the fish he catches and dries are now shipped to England. Digging for clams along the shore is still a task for the children. This is a task that children enjoy and one which is very important to settlers who still must rest their food directly from land and sea. Food must be taken from shore and from field, from lake and from stream. And there's game to be had in the forests too. John Fox has learned well the paths of the nearby forests which harbor many turkeys but recently brought from abroad. In the gardens of the settlement, medicinal herbs are grown, some of local origin and others transplanted from England. Mistress Lane, who is skilled in their preparation and use, supervises a selection to be used in a special broth. Later, she carries her preparation to a case of serious illness in the home of Harold Perry. Here's a draft of herbs, fresh brewed for Mistress Perry. Tis most timely and welcome for the pain is still sharp. Yes, there is still sickness, and there is still the helpfulness of neighbor toward neighbor. There has to be in a new land where the settlers face the uncertainties of a new way of life. Mistress Perry knows that building a better world requires courage and faith. And these men writing back to England, they know that too. We are sorry to send back the ship without better lading, but there be much sickness among us, and many of our number lack strength to survive the winter's cold. Yet, for the most, we remain of good heart and make what haste we can to build our plantation. Among our number, there be those of diverse motives, some mainly prizing liberty of conscience, 
and some chiefly seeking worldly gain. Yet we form one body politic joined by common consent. There is resolve and hope and promise here where men still build. Here on a shore where men can say, we form one body politic joined by common consent. <laughs>